Hi, all. This is Marav Fine calling in from the Jewish Funders Network um, offices in New York City. I'm here um, hosting this webinar with our friends at Base Hillel. Um, and we're really excited to learn with them about what the new model of Jewish engagement can look like and how it can impact our future. Um, JFN, as you know, is a network of high net worth Jewish philanthropists committed to creating change through networks and connectivity. Um, all of our programming is based in our JFN values, and this one in particular, we're focusing on the importance of inclusion, ELU ELU, pluralistic organizations, um, valuing the richness of diversity, and of course, partnership, um, working together across organizations, learning from funders engaging in their, in their grantee work. Um, we know that that's the very base of what, what makes this work, what makes our community work, and we're really excited to hear from everyone. Should I use your name? So um, just to introduce the folks on the call briefly, and then they'll, they'll be introducing themselves throughout. Um, we have with us Dan Smokler, who is a JFN member and also the Chief Innovation Officer from Hillel, um, a Chief Innovation Officer uh, from Hillel International and also a rabbi. Um, we have Faith Leaner, a dear friend and also a founder at Base Hillel. And uh, we have uh, Stephen M. Cohen, who's a senior researcher and has done an immense amount of work um, understanding the Jewish community and its trends. And we're going to hear from all three of them today talking about base, about trends in Jewish communal um, engagement and involvement, um, and, and what the, the impetus for all of this was. Um, so without further ado, Dan, please take it away. Thank you, Mayrov, and uh, really thank you to JFN for the opportunity to uh, spend a little bit of time talking about uh, this project with everyone here today. Um, if you have questions, comments, thoughts, or reactions, we encourage you to use the chat and questions feature on the webinar so that we can respond to you. Uh, in real time. I'm just going to uh, let you know we're speaking about BASE uh, today, which is short for BASE LL, and uh, we're going to be using some of the slides that you have before you, and we'll reference them as we're talking. So BASE is really a movement of rabbinic couples who use their home as a center or convening point for pluralistic Jewish life, uh, primarily hospitality for Shabbat holiday meals, uh, Jewish learning, and for service, chesed or tzedek. And really to give you a sense of, uh, of what's going on, um, in Base Hillel uh, around the country. I want to introduce Faith Leaner, um, who is a founder of the movement and who runs the base in Williamsburg to sort of walk you through what it looks like concretely. Following Faith, I'll give you some of the ideas animating the movement, and Stephen will tell you about uh, what he's found in evaluating it and how it fits into the bigger Jewish picture. So here is Faith. Hi, everyone. Uh, Marav, thank you again for allowing us this opportunity to uh, share a little bit about our experience this past year. Um, for those on the call, my name is Faith Weiner, um, and Dan has asked me to share a little bit about my background and really what brought me to this project. Um, so I grew up in Charlotte, North Carolina, uh, the daughter of two physicians, one who was my mother, uh, Jewish, but really not affiliated, and my father, who wasn't Jewish, and Buddhism really uh, influenced his life more than anything else. And throughout my life, we really were not so involved in the Jewish community, definitely um, more on the peripheral. And over time, my family became more uh, involved in Chabad. And one of the things that really struck me about Chabad was that these were people who were living Judaism, uh, not practicing Judaism. And the notion of radical hospitality really uh, was very profound for me, to be really welcomed into a rabbi's home and treated as a part of their family. So this started uh, driving an idea in me of how do we make more spaces that's really rooted in that, of helping people see each other as an extended family with all that complex complexity and diversity. Um, over time, I started, you know, following up on this kind of Jewish journey of my own, which led me to Brandeis eventually and to Pardes. Um, and I eventually met my husband at Pardes, who is now a rabbi, and Throughout all of this time, I was really asking the question, how do we create a space that is deeply rooted in Jewish knowledge, tradition, and values, but simultaneously is open and warm and contemporary, that's intellectually honest and rigorous? Um, I had a lot of uh, profound influence also from the Moish House, which my sister started in Charlotte, and so I was thinking about really the home as this convening point. 
Um, to kind of fast forward a little bit, when I was in graduate school at NYU doing a dual degree where I met Marav, I also met Dan Smokler at the Bronfman Center. And we started really exploring this idea of how to actualize this vision of using a home in a deeply pluralistic, inclusive setting that was rooted in its local community and a strong partner to those around it. Um, and that formalized, with the help of the UJ Federation of New York, into this project called Base Hillel. Um, the first iteration, the first idea was that it would be working with uh, students. What we found is that we are really working with graduate students and with post-college students. Um, and it, within a year, uh, it really, really flourished. We have had thousands of people in our homes. Um, just to give you an idea of what it actually looks and feels like a little bit, so the base is actually a home in, in downtown. It's an apartment. Um, in Brooklyn, it's, uh, it's a townhouse. And we welcome people in anywhere from two to four times during the week. Um, every Sunday night, we have service cooking for the local churches in our neighborhoods. Um, every Tuesday night and Wednesday night, we have some type of tour learning that's rooted in text, but that also brings in a very contemporary and relevant um, uh, position as well. We sometimes will bring in different speakers based on what our participants are interested in talking about, whether it be the refugees in Syria or what's going on post the election. Um, we always have a service opportunity, as I mentioned, and then the last piece, which you know doesn't happen necessarily in our homes, but is crucial to our work, is the pastoral work that we do. We see dozens of people weekly who want to talk about their interfaith relationships, or the fact that they've lost their first job, or their parent is sick, um, and so that has been one of our primary roles. And then the week really culminates in Shabbat around our table, and it could be either 15 people in a more intimate setting, or it could be 30 people for a Kabbalah Shabbat, um, egalitarian style with people bringing their friends and a little bit more potluck. So that's just to give you kind of an idea of the, um, what happens in a week and where we came from. And I'm going to hand it back to Dan to talk about some of the ideas that really root our work. Uh, and again, just reminding you, if you have questions, comments, thoughts, or reactions, to please uh, feel free to share those. Uh, I'm just going to offer five ideas that are animating the base movement. These are not in the slides before you, but uh, nonetheless, I'm going to share with you five ideas uh, that are, in fact, animating the base movement. Uh, they're not in the slides before you. So the first idea is just that um, the young adult space is different in this generation than it ever has been before. Um, it used to be that people went to college and they met their spouse in college or immediately thereafter, but as we're all aware, um, that's not the case. People are marrying later. They're moving from city to city and experimenting with jobs and professions um, in a period that you know, we now call emerging adulthood. Um, so the idea that Hillel as an organization would be uh, hermetically sealed to those four years surrounding a college campus is not in keeping with the reality of students that we're serving today. Um, students live in a much more porous and fluid environment where they, uh, particularly in commuter campuses, go to college, stop going to college, and then return. They leave college and go back and become students for an MBA, JD, or PhD. Um, they are dating and socializing with people that are both in college and in the urban setting beyond. So we needed something that could serve people, not just as a center on a college campus, but could actually move into the porous and fluid space of friends and students beyond. Um, and in so doing, uh, we're, we're ultimately returning back to Hillel's original roots of being a base Hillel, or a base Hillel, a Hillel house, uh, a home that could serve people. Um, four other ideas animating base. The second one is the notion of rabbis. Um, one of the things that I've been struck by in the 12 years I've been working with young adults, 18 to 22, is how uh, much the title rabbi has cachet with a large swath of the population. It's not true with everyone. Many people prefer a do-it-yourself style of Judaism, um, but I would argue that most do not. Um, and that's uh, seen in the number of young people that are reaching out to our base rabbis for pastoral guidance, to do weddings, to do conversions, to uh, work with people through difficult moments in their life. So rabbinic presence is something uh, that I think has been undervalued that we're trying to reemphasize. A third point is the power of the Jewish home as an educational center. So in contrast to creating um, a scene or uh, a center or a building, what we're doing is offering people a home. This is the home of a couple that are spending their life together, um, usually raising children. Um, it's not an apartment. It's not a Jewish community center. It's not a camp. It's a home. And uh, that's not to denigrate or knock anything else, but to emphasize that a Jewish home has enormous power. 
And particularly for young adults, um, they really are looking for a home, usually not their parents' home, uh, but it's an unarticulated need that isn't surfaced because homes are seen as too normative. And what we've done is create a fluid and porous accessible home. Um, just two last ideas. One is data-driven engagement. Um, BASE uses a form of Salesforce to track every single one of its relationships so that we can say to you with confidence that we've reached over 1,875 people in the first year, um, and we can speak in great detail about how many of them have come back two, three, and four times, what the nature of their engagement is, what the profile of those people are. This is a data-driven model um, in the fullest sense. And then finally, um, an idea that's surfaced through BASE and is animating it is a notion of entrepreneurship. Um, the title rabbi simply does not come with any Jews attached to it. You have to build a community you want to serve in most cases, and what we're trying to do with BASE is also change the nature of the rabbinate for people uh, around the world. So those are five ideas that are undergirding the BASE movement. Uh, and again, if anyone has any questions out there, or thoughts or comments, we encourage you to share them. And I'm just going to turn it over to Stephen uh, Cohn, who's going to share with you some of what he's seen. Hi, um, and Dan mentioned that we're um, data. Yeah, that his his model, his model is data driven, and um, uh, in the course of the year, Dr. Soon to be Dr. Ariel Levitas of, of uh, NYU in Philadelphia, and I conducted a study, both qualitative and quantitative, of um, who comes to base and what do they get out of it, and and what do they think about it, so forth and so on. So um, uh, the, the, qual the qualitative uh, work that Ariel did um, pointed to some uh, extraordinary enthusiasm, community building, relationships, um, and, and great diversity among, among the participants. And of course, that, that helped us um, uh, design a, a survey, which uh, little, little pieces of which I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you, um, that actually would underscore and enlarge upon that message. Um, so at, at the time when we went, to, Dan mentioned the list, that you know, at the time um, the base people had about 1,000 uh, participants on their list. We sent out a questionnaire to all of them, about the 300 responded, the 30% response rate is regarded as ridiculously high in this, in this day and age. And um, one of the slides I wanted to show you that to me was very, very significant and meaningful were their images of base. Um, and then you'll see here, 95% claim that base has a warm and joyful atmosphere. 85% said, at base, I feel comfortable being myself without fear of judgment. Um, in, in the latter 20th century, early 21st century, um, one of the major challenges for Jewish educational institutions is to um, overcome the fear of judgment and yet maintain its... Um, uh, it's, educators needed to maintain their commitment to or, or authentic Jewish life. Um, a, a few educators have actually managed to, to do that. And it seems here that BASE does both. Um, there are rabbinic couples um, who, who establish relationships that overcome fear of judgment. Um, and then, and then they, they also will go on, as I'll just show you that 64% say to a great extent Base connects me to Jewish meaning and spirituality. Uh, meaning has become a critical um, uh, criterion for measuring Jewish uh, engagement and growth. Um, and the fact that they're saying that is actually just speaks very well. Um, and then we see that um, to some extent, or to a great extent, 50%, 41% say, I met people who are very different from me. And as I'll show you imminently, um, they're right. Um, base is, is extraordinary. In its ability to um, to to reach across the spectrum that I haven't seen in, in, in my extensive research and other uh, another uh, uh, educational in innovations, I have made friends at base. You get a third to say to a great extent, a half saying to, to somewhat, um, and will uh, will and the, the making of friends has been uh, actually has been a goal of base, and it's one of the, one of the uh, one of the objectives that the base wants to focus on in, in this year, in the second year. And then um, we also have some, um, in a good survey research fashion, we also pose negative comments and to see how many people agree, and they largely disagree. 80% uh, feel, not at all is it true that I feel uncomfortable inviting my friends to base. And 88% even more say, there's not much room for a variety of viewpoints at base. By the way, comments that, you would, that people would expect to utter 
about many other Jewish institutions. Uh, and here they're saying, no, no, there, there is room for a variety of, of viewpoints at base. So we have an overall, um, an overall portrait of, um, of, uh, of positive feelings. Now, you would say, well, why isn't it more positive? Well, it's not more positive because we have people here who went to base once, people who went to two, two activities, three activities. And what we show is that the, um, the higher, and here, here we have those, those images again, we have people who have um, many positive images, people who have moderate positive images, people with low, low images, and you see a very, very different profile. Those with the highest images are also that, that big red line. The other people who had the highest level of activities, um, uh, and then the moderate, they're moderate and low, low. In other words, there's a relationship between how often you come to base and how well you think of it. And that's, this, is a, this is a chicken egg problem. We don't we, we didn't follow people and put little little uh, little uh, um, registers on their fingernails to figure out who's feeling what at what time. But basically, people who felt good about base returned. People who returned to base felt better and better. And um, uh, and all we have here is this correlational analysis with all those problems. Yet the um, if base is working, you you want to see these correlations. You want to see people feeling better about base the more they come. And indeed, that's what they're saying. We have, we have more evidence of that in the next chart. Um, you know, before that was images of base. That was, you know, it's kind of what you think about base. Here's what you, how you feel about base. And good feelings is, is saying, I feel joyful. I made friends. I have Jewish meaning. I feel comfortable. And those feelings sharply grow with more participation at base. And, and, um, and, and finally, we have um, uh, people who report changes. Uh, I got personal advice. I, I saw Judaism could play a role in my life. I saw that Shabbat could be important to me. I, I became familiar with the Jewish calendar. I changed something in my life. I changed my Jewish practice. That was like, we created this index of, I changed. And um, we don't know whether they changed. Like we, don't, we didn't record them before and after, but at least we have their personal testimony. Hello, uh, I went, the more I went, the more I change, and they're moving in directions that those precisely the directions that these base educators want to see. And last but not least, to me, this is one of the most startling uh, charts of all. Um, and you're not going to be able to see it all, but basically, here's the story. The story is that Jewish socialization, that is, you know, what, what happened in your in your family and community, and Jewish education actually work. And that, but by, by what they mean, what I mean is that what happened in your childhood and adolescence actually propels you forward to all the Jewish innovations that we, that, that we, um, that, that we have launched as collectively as a community, be it you know, birthright or Jewish studies classes or Hillel, whatever. And one of the big concerns that anybody who opens up a new innovation is, has is that, well, maybe only the affiliated are going to show up or the people who are heavily socialized. And normally what you see is you know, a lot of people who have strong Jewish backgrounds, have been to Israel, have been to, you know, have been to day schools heavily in married parents, so forth and so on. Well, here, this is, I'm just giving you a couple of um, uh, tidbits, I and mean, we, we looked at the entire profile. What we found is that we have people across the entire spectrum. We have, we have people who hardly go to synagogue. 47% go, you know, went, go to synagogue, high holidays or less. We have people who are raised Orthodox, but half of them dropped away, you know, and then we have, we have lots of not so denominationally affiliated types. In fact, we have about 11% of the base participants who are, who were raised not Jewish. Um, I don't mean with one Jewish parent. I mean, they were raised not Jewish and they're there. And that's because, is this the last shot, by the way? Yeah. That's because in another shot, which you don't see, I uh, will have to happily send you the full report. Um, uh, we, we found that something like 23% of people who have a partner slash spouse report that the partner is not Jewish. Um, at the same time, we have a lot of, you know, a nice sizable number of people who are raised Orthodox. And so we have the entire spectrum from intensively socialized, highly educated, all the way over to people not so, not so strongly socialized, and people who have a significant number. This is New, this is New York. And have 23% with non-Jewish spouses at a Jewish educational um, center is really remarkable. And to have the non-Jewish members of those partnerships 
and others, by the way, non-Jews who are not who are not part of the Jews showing up, his testimony to the ability of base to reach beyond the conventional audience. So that this is the, so. In, in, in summing up, base combines some of the really brilliant lessons we've learned from Hillel, from Chabad, from Moshe House, um, from a variety uh, from a variety of uh, experiments and innovations that are fact, frankly working very well. But here, all those uh, elements of practice are brought together in a single model. And it seems to be doing a, an extraordinary um, uh, uh, achievement in reaching people beyond the pale, but also people who are, are inside, the, inside, inside the Jewish beltway, and moving them along on Jewish journeys uh, the more they participate. Great, thanks, Stephen. Um, before I hand it off to Dan to kind of close this up before uh, questions and answers, I just wanted to, to state when people ask me, you know, why, why do you think BASE has been successful, I think I would summarize it in three primary ideas. One is that it's rooted and yet it's inclusive. It's rooted in tradition. It's rooted in a rabbi's knowledge and pastoral training, communal or community organizing training, but it's inclusive and it's also part of the contemporary conversation. You don't have to check a piece of your identity at the door. And I think millennials are really looking for places where they can both engage in their Jewish sides of their personality and also in their other sides, but not at the expense of, of the other. Um, the second piece I think why it's been successful, and we didn't really focus on this, but I'd say that it's really pivotal on the ground, is our partnerships. We have really um, had the privilege in New York of partnering with over a dozen uh, local organizations, national organizations, one of our strongest partners are the local Moisha houses in our neighborhoods. Um, we probably have one event a week, if not every other week, um, with our local Moisha houses. And sometimes that's us educating the, the people who live in the Moisha house so they can amplify their work. And sometimes it's doing a joint event at our home or it's doing a joint event there. We work with Repair the World on all of our service with the understanding that we're not the expert in service and social justice, but they are, and people are seeking that. Um, so partnerships have really fueled our work, and we feel like we're really um, strengthening our local communities, which is very important to us. And lastly, I'd say the home. There's a feeling of authenticity when you walk into someone's home, a feeling of vulnerability. And I think in us offering ourselves, our most authentic, most real self, people um, meet us there. And I think that, for me, is what really fuels our work. I'm just going to hand it off back to Dan. So the, looking forward, uh, just so you know where we stand now, there are two bases in New York. Um, there's one downtown, one in Brooklyn. There is one in Chicago in Lincoln Park. There's one opening in Los Angeles in the fall. There's a base partner, what we call Powered by Base, which is a franchise model in Washington, D.C. And then in the summertime, we do pop-up bases uh, for a few months at a time in Eastern Europe. We have one in Berlin this last summer, and we'll be in Berlin and Budapest uh, this coming summer. Um, so we're just going to pause right now and ask uh, those of you who have graciously listened to us for the last 25 minutes if there are any questions or comments or thoughts uh, that we could use to open up the conversation. So I'm going to unmute everyone, and you all can feel free to... Uh, the conference has been questions. unmuted. Uh, so, so you're all unmuted. Uh, this is Marav. You can ask any questions you want. Um, I, I have one question sort of to, to start with, um, which, is, which is for Dan. Um, as, as a funder, right, looking at these numbers, um, you're also, you lead this organization, but you're also a funder. So in straddling those two spaces, can you speak to what, um, how, how have these numbers impacted the way that you're thinking about uh, funding and engaging in this space? And what would you say to other funders or foundation professionals, of which we have many on this call, about taking this information into consideration um, as they're thinking about funding models or grantees? Um, I, I can only speak personally about that. You know, representing the KMD Foundation, which is my family's foundation, um, there are two primary aspects of this project which inspire us. Um, the first is the extraordinary return on investment in working with young people, um, age 18 to 30. Um, we feel that um, the money that's put in in hiring a rabbinic couple not only pays extraordinary dividends in terms of the sheer number and volume of people that we're achieving, uh, that we're reaching, um, but it's the nature of the relationship-based engagement that inspires us. When uh, folks are in the home of a rabbi, 
um, we know that they will eventually come back uh, and ask that rabbi to do their wedding, to be with them when a grandparent, God forbid, dies, or to help them through a hard time. Um, so it's um, not just a, a large number of relationships, but it's a depth and quality and Jewish authenticity to relationships that's inspiring us. And second, uh, myself and my parents, we've been on the board of seminaries as diverse as JTS and Yeshivat Maharat and uh, YCT and, uh, you know, Reform seminaries in Israel. Um, so we're interested in training a new generation of rabbis. And we feel that BASE uh, trains entrepreneurial rabbis and offers a vision of the rabbinate of tomorrow. So those are the two things that really move us as funders. Thank you, Dan. Anybody else want to weigh in there? I'm just looking at the call. I'm seeing Bev Shemansky and Alyssa and Dana and Josh and Karen and Jim and all kinds of people on there, and a lot of people with California phone numbers. We'd love to hear your voice if, uh, if there's anything that you'd like to add in here. So don't be shy. Jump in. I'm a sociologist, so I, 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 I have a ready-made excuse to ask questions so, and be curious and maybe even boundary crossing. Why are you listening? Why do you, why do you care about base or you know, what, what got you on the phone call? Um, this is Karen. I'll speak just to break the awkward silence, I guess. Can you hear me? Am I off mute? Oh, yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, we hear you. <laughs> okay. Um, so I, I will answer that question, um, which is um, the foundation for which I work is um, interested in two things, um, one being engaging the least engaged, particularly interfaith couples, um, and also, we are supporting a new initiative um, to expand the number of independent spiritual communities around the country uh, that is being incubated um, by Moshe House. So um, for both of those reasons, um, and I know Dan and have heard about Dan's work, and I think the last time we spoke was when Beis Hillel was early um, in its iteration. So um, for me, it was just to hear you know, where it's come, um, to hear um, what the plans are for moving forward, uh, and just to listen to conversation if there is any. Hi. Um, do you hear me? Yes. Yeah. yeah. All right. So I'm actually Carolyn Levine. I was sitting with Beth Shemansky, who actually has another call. So I kind of took over the rest of the call. Um, so I'm currently the professional bringing Moshe House to Montreal, and I'm working closely with them to help that get started. So I think one of the reasons why we are on the call, or I was asked to sit for the rest of the call, is similar to what was just said about how to work with, like, how BASE can work towards it and work with Moshe House, and how, like, kind of just hearing the different methodologies you guys have. Great. Great. Yes, uh, Faith, you want to weigh in on that a little bit? Sure. Um, so I mentioned this earlier on in the call, but for me personally, one of the most um, fundamental uh, parts of my Jewish experience was when my sister started the Moish House in my hometown of Charlotte. And what I saw happen there was, you know, someone who was increasingly curious in Judaism, who really wanted to take more ownership, had the opportunity to do so. And it was an amazing community there. And so... For us, you know, we get the question a lot, how does this compete with Moish House? Well, how does it relate to Moish House? And for us, that answer was really obvious in that we view ourselves as having the same mission but offering different things, right? So in Moisha House, um, you have a bunch of young professionals who are working full-time but who want to really use their home as a convening place. And for us, we have, you know, a, a rabbi and their partner who wants to use their home as a convening place. The main differences are that in Moisha House, these young professionals have their own lives. They have their own jobs. This is very part-time for them. And sometimes it can be stressful trying to imagine to build five or seven programs a month 
Um, and so what they've, what our partnership has really looked like, at least in New York, has been helping them do that. So if they say, you know, we're really interested in doing something for Tu Bishvat, we don't really know so much and we're not sure what to do, then we'll create a joint program with them. It's our full-time work. We feel really committed to it. We're happy to do our events in their space. We don't feel that everything needs to be in our homes all the time. Um, so in certain cases, it's been us. Um, doing joint partnerships, which is really just a joint program. And other times, the, the Moisha House participants themselves really come to our um, weekly learning groups so that they can um, increase their own Jewish knowledge and really what we hope is to have an amplifying effect, that some of the things that they learn at base with the rabbis and some of the pastoral sessions that they have can really help them think about their work in a little bit more of a focused way. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks for the question. Um, are there any more questions or comments? We're happy to, we have extra time here. We don't have to use it, but we're open. We're getting a message here that um, the silence of the participants, the women are, should be interpreted as tacit support for a Trump presidency. <laughs> and we're not sure that's the case. <laughs> but the only way that we'll know that is if, they, you know, if you chime in and ask questions, comments, thoughts, or reactions. I, 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 if someone wants to say something, please just stop me. Just Steven. But I, I want to say that what, what I witnessed at base, when I when I go to a Hanukkah event and I can't get in because there's sort of people waiting ahead of me at the door, or or a Purim event, or that then at a Shabbat table, or then at a Sukkah, or then at a uh, a lecture on Israel by a certain non certainly now now disgraced but leading Israeli journalist. Who, uh, but what I see is a is a combination of activities that are not not just faith, and I, I, I want to thank faith, but I'm talking about faith, small f, um, not just faith-based, but also transcends faith, spirit, um, politics, the social, and the social and the personal are critical in, in, in all this. And um, what I see based doing is not just reaching um, interfaith couples, but intergroup couples, people who have, who have who have partners of a different ethnicity? Who, who are you know? Who are, they're they're not Christian, but they're but they're they're certainly not Jewish, and and having and and being able to combine the the social, the cultural, the political, and the spiritual is something that you can only do if you're in a home, if you're in a full community, and that that to me is what um, is what the the base represents. It really represents coming together of various strands that, I guess, have been developed over the years but are now intertwining. And, I, you know, I, frankly, I, I think that there, it's, it's reached a, um, a, a model of, um, uh, I wouldn't call it perfection, but of you know, the best possible chance that we have of engaging Jews at, at all levels of engagement. Um, so that, that, to me, that's really remarkable. And I, those of you who know my research know, and I have to say this, if you don't know my research, I'll just say it, um, a very critical I really walk away, and I, I, I tell people, you know, this, this thing you're doing is worthless, and I want to just bring that to say that I, I, have a cred I hope I have a credibility to say, oh, this is really, really remarkable. I remember Dan and Faith asking me, did you get these results with all your studies? I said, no, this is really, this is really extraordinary, and um, you, you're onto something really, really powerful here. Uh, go and, uh, go and, uh, and, and, and make more of it. Thank you, Stephen. Okay. We just we got one question in. Um, Robert Glazer, which, that question? Yes. Uh, Faith and I are going to weigh in on that. What's the reaction from existing synagogues? So uh, we're going to speak about it in two different ways. The first is we have a partner in Washington um, doing something called Powered by Base, which is where um, they pay us uh, almost like a franchise fee, and we do uh, training, ongoing support, and cohort development and data with people that want to do base. And that individual, Rami, um, is actually supported by 10 conservative synagogues in the Rockville area and by Reshet Ramah. And they see his base as an amplifier for those young couples uh, that are not yet engaged or not fully engaged in synagogue life. Remember, that one of the main things the base does is host Shabbat dinner and holiday meals, which is not um, usually a synagogue strong suit. Usually a synagogue is better at tefillah and other aspects than, uh, than the hosting per se. But I'll let Faith weigh in on this. 
Um, it's a great question. You know, it's interesting. When we first started, we anticipated that there would be a lot of pushback. And in certain, in certain scenarios, there was a little bit, but there really wasn't nearly as much as we thought. I think part of that is, is what Dan mentioned at the end there. You know, I think for synagogues traditionally as a place of tefillah and prayer, we don't really have, um, except for the high holidays and occasionally Kabbalat Shabbat services, which our participants asked us for, we don't really make base as prayer space in large part because if people are looking for a prayer space, they, they do have synagogues. And we're not trying to undermine what exists. We're trying to supplement. Um, and so that's one thing. And the other part I'd say is part of our work, and I think creating something that is new and in many ways base is, is not new actually, right? It's, it's similar to Chabad and it's similar to Moish House. It's just a different combination of ideas. Um, but in creating something new, we've found that there is a lot of feeling of threat and fear and uncertainty. And so that we just take that as a part of our work, that when you are trying to start something new, sometimes there will be feelings of competition. And how we've tried to respond to that is having meetings with those people and talking through and saying, how can we help your community? Would you like um, our educator to teach a class with your community? Can, would you like to send people? So try to keep the conversation open. And we also try not to let it um, hinder us from moving forward because you know, disruptive innovation is disruptive. Well, I, I had the privilege of leading the 2011 Jewish Community Study of New York. And one of the things we, t we, we discovered is that below 23rd Street in Manhattan and extending well into Brownstone, Brooklyn, there were um, a, a huge number of um, unaffiliated younger Jews. That's, that's the only way to put it. It's the area with the highest uh, intergroup marriage rate in the, uh, in the area. And one of the area, an area with an usually low number of Jewish institutions. Well, all I'm saying is that everybody recognizes, um, uh, and there's you know no sense of ownership or competition, that that this area, which is where, by the way, both base facilities are pretty much located, is an area of of great you know, challenge and opportunity. And uh, I have to say that um, synagogues in the, in the New, York, New York area, at least, um, it would be it would be startling to me that they would be possessive over the Jewish young people uh, between, uh, you know, in lower Manhattan and Brownstone, Brooklyn, frankly, or even in their own, in their own neighborhoods. It's simply, we, we are beyond, you know, beyond 1985, where synagogues used to protest that other institutions are doing their job. They're now, you know, everybody's really concerned about how do you, you know, how do you reach and engage uh, Jewish young people um, uh, from the ages of, you know, basically 18 to 34, and base is right, right in that middle. We, we just want to say thank you. We really, really appreciate uh, the time folks have taken uh, on this call. Um, if there's any final questions or thoughts, we'll just invite those now. And if not, uh, we'll close up in just a moment. Yes, very much. Important to be in touch with you. Great. Uh, May Rob has a copy of the full report that uh, Stephen and, uh, and Ariel Levitas did and she is willing to send it to any of you. And we are more than willing to be in touch if anyone would like uh, more information about this project uh, or the work that it's doing. And if you would ever like to come see a base in New York, in Chicago, or in Berlin, please let us know, and, uh, and we will see you soon. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dan. And I'll be sending around a, um, a follow-up email that I'll have a brief survey for you guys to take to let us know how we're doing. Um, the video uh, that was made of this presentation along with all the questions and answers, the research that Dan just mentioned, and, um, and of course their, the contact information uh, for the folks at BASE if you have any additional questions. Thank you guys again as always for joining us on this webinar. We really appreciate your time and your interest. Um, have a wonderful week and a great Thanksgiving. Take care all. Bye-bye.